Well, hey guys, what's up? Pastor Matt here. I'm going to do a brand new series and it's going to be a mini series. I'm going to do three or four of these short little videos called The Verse That Saved. And then I'm going to talk today about Jonathan Edwards. In the next video, I'm going to do Charles Spurgeon. Then after that, Martin Luther. And then after that, St. Augustine. So in each one of these short little videos, I'm going to look at the text of scripture that was powerful in the work of conversion to save some of the eminent saints who have made such a great difference throughout Christian history. Now, even as I title this series, The Verse That Saved, of course, we know that salvation is a work of God's Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, God primarily uses the word, the word written and the word preached to change the hearts of his elect saints. We call that the effectual call. And so in this short little video series, what I'm going to do is just take a look at some of those Bible passages that the Holy Spirit of God used to change the hearts of these great men. So today we're going to talk about Jonathan Edwards. Now, obviously, Edwards is a person who's near and dear to this particular channel. You guys all probably know already that he's my dead mentor. But if you don't know anything about Edwards, his dates of life are 1703 to 1758. He is notable not only as the local church pastor of the Northampton Church, one of the most important churches in New England, but also one of the revivalists, a participant in the Great Awakening alongside George Whitfield and others in the 1740s. He's the writer of a number of important theological works, including the freedom of the will, religious affections, and a bunch of others besides. And not only that, but he's a missionary and a philosopher as well. So Edwards is legacy is as long as a shadow in the evening. He's a very important figure, especially in American Christian history here on this side of the Great Pond. And we're going to look at the verse that converted him today. Well, let's talk about his childhood for just a second. Edwards was, of course, raised in a Christian family, a devoted Christian family. That's going to be a little bit different from some of the other people we're going to feature in this short little series. In fact, his dad was a pastor. His grandfather was a pastor. He was raised by some of the most important ministerial influences of the early colonies. His grandfather was Solomon Stoddard, for goodness sakes, and his father, Timothy Edwards, was no slouch in any stretch of the word. And so Edwards was raised to be a Christian. He was baptized as a child. He was raised knowing the Westminster Shorter Catechism. He was trained at Yale, and believe it or not, back in those days, Yale was actually a good school to get trained in, not so much anymore, at least for the purposes of divinity or practically anything else for, uh, anything else for that matter. Um, and Edwards was basically trained to be a pastor. He um, had wanted to be a minister. His parents reared him to be a minister. And yet, there was a problem. The problem is that according to Edwards and his parents, he was not yet converted. Now, this gets really interesting because how does one go through seminary? How does one go through Bible college or ministerial training and even have some opportunities to preach and teach when he's not yet fully converted? Well, that goes back to what we might call the Puritan morphology of salvation. Now, hang with me just for a second here, because today, uh, as Christians, evangelical Christians, we're pretty loose and fast with how we talk about salvation. Sign a pledge card, come forward, every head down, every eye closed, pray this prayer. We know the drill. But in those days, the Puritans were far more rigorous when it came to analyzing the work of God's Holy Spirit in the soul. And as far as the traditional Puritan motif went from Puritans like William Perkins and even Jonathan Edwards' father, Timothy Edwards, there was a pretty strict what we call a morphology of experiences that a person was expected to have gone through in order to demonstrate their conversion and be able to give testimony to the church publicly and therefore to receive the Lord's table. Now, the morphology goes something like this, and there was three or four steps depending on who was writing or preaching about it. But first of all, a person would experience conviction or awakening. That was supposedly the first stage that something is happening in your soul. And so this person might begin thinking about death. Uh, maybe they experience a death of somebody in their family. Maybe all of a sudden a sermon hits them and they realize that they're a spiritual being and that one day their body's going to be in the grave and they start worrying about heaven and hell. And they called that first stage conviction or awakening. But that wasn't the end. For the Puritans after that, a person would normally then go through what they called legal terrors. And that is, the person would decide to reform their life. They would try to do better. They would try to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They would make an effort to be a religious person or whatever it is. And they would inevitably fail in that because they would realize then that they cannot obey the law of God. And the law then was supposed to have this terrifying effect on the believer. 
where he realizes that he cannot hold what Sinai teaches, even the Ten Commandments. He can't uphold them. Even the first and second great commandments, love God with all your heart and love your, your neighbor as yourself, we realize we can't do that. And the Puritans expected that to be a terrifying thought for people who were under their preaching ministry. And then third, what would happen is they would come to a place of humiliation. That is to say, they would be utterly despondent. They would be heartbroken at their inability to save themselves. And then finally, new light or the new spirit or the new heart would take upon them and they would realize that uh, the conversion or salvation had been wrought by the gracious hand of Almighty God through his son by the power of his spirit. Now in Edwards's case, something was amiss because Edwards never could testify to that second step, the legal terrors step. And so his own father was somewhat doubtful that Edwards had experienced conversion. And when we read his diaries and some of his personal writings from the time, we're talking the early 1720s here, Edwards is racking his mind and uh, examining his own heart to see if he's been converted. And then finally, this verse. Edwards happens upon 1 Timothy 1.17, which says this, and I'm quoting here, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And here Edwards describes the floodgates opening up of grace and mercy as he contemplates the goodness of God in the gospel. He thinks about God's eternal majesty, his glory, and his power. And what we're going to do now is we're going to read this in his own words. This is from the works of Jonathan Edwards, volume 16. That's the personal writings, page 792, from a section called his personal narrative, where Edwards is writing now several years later. In fact, in 1740, 41, he looks back on his early 20s to late teens, and he says this, quoting, the first that I remember that ever I found anything of that sort of inward sweet delight in God and divine things that I have lived much in, in since was on reading these words, 1 Timothy 1.17, now unto the king eternal, immortal and invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And he says, still quoting, as I read the words, read the words, there came into my soul, and as it was diffused through it, a sense of the glory of the divine being, a new sense quite different from anything I'd experienced before, never any words of scripture seemed to me as those words did. I thought with myself how excellent a being that was and how happy I should be if I might enjoy that God and be wrapped up to God in heaven and be, as it were, swallowed up in him. And so it's the divine nature of God, his glory and his majesty that really just explodes with joy in Edwards' heart. And he says, I'm going to quote here again, I kept saying that as it were singing over these words of scripture to myself and went to prayer and to pray to God that I might enjoy him and prayed in a manner quite different from what I used to do with a new sort of affection. And that word affection for Edwards is going to be one of his key theological terms as he works on his corpus of writings, especially as he diagnoses uh, the work of the Great Awakenings, looking for what true religion is. Edwards will very often point back to that term, the affections, the very change of one's heart. And so we might say this by way of application, dwell much on the glory of God. Sometimes when we think of salvation, uh, it's very much uh, attuned to us. What we were doing, where we were, uh, what our situation is, what emotions we were feeling, and yet Edwards's conversion points us to this exploding grace that, in his, his words, swallowed me up, as it were, when he thinks about the greatness, the glory, the mercies, and the majesty of God. Well, we're going to continue looking at the lives of some of these saints as we think about the passages of the Bible that converted them or God used to convert them. But I do just want to simply point you to some of the resources that you might find in the description of this video. Maybe they will be helpful to you. By the way, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Matt. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA, a conservative Bible-believing Reformed church just north of Pittsburgh. Come worship with us on the Lord's Day if you get the chance. I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.